Father, we thank you so much for this day because you've made it. No, no one else in here has made this day. It is a gift from the hand of you. And God, I pray that we do our job, and that is to rejoice and be glad in it, Father. We, we are in love with you, God, because you're, you're worthy. You are the one living, true God. And we would even cease to exist if it were not for you. And so, Father, we thank you that you allow us to be here within your presence today, Father. This is not about us and what we want to do, God, but it is about what you have us to do, Father. May we always, God, be in your will. And whenever we walk out of it, Father, I pray in the name and the blood of your Son, Jesus, that you would lovingly show us where we've strayed, Father. Help us, God, to be right with you. God, I pray that I not be seen nor heard today, Father, but that you alone would be seen and heard through me, God, that you would get all of the honor, all of the glory, all of the credit, all of the praise, that, that, that this service is not about people, it's about you. We're here to honor you, Father. And after that, you work on the hearts of the people. So God, I pray that we can hear in every realm that you want us to hear from today. Remove the burdens from the people's hearts and shoulders and minds, Father. God, I pray that they be free to receive everything that you have for them. God, we thank you for this family of believers and the unity in it. In the precious name and the blood of Jesus Christ, all God's children said, church, amen. Let's give God a clap of praise. He alone is worthy. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. And turn in your Bibles, please, if you will, church, to the book of Exodus. We're going to begin with the third chapter. Excuse me. We're going to begin with the third chapter. <clears throat> and believe it or not, as much as we bounce around in Scripture, today we're, we're going to be camped out in the book of Exodus. And we're going to run through chapter 3. We're going to end up, I believe, in the 10th chapter. So we're going to, we're going to, we're going to stay here for quite a while. <clears throat> we're not reading every verse of every chapter 3 through 10, so that, that's going to be some homework for you. Exodus chapter 3, beginning with the first verse. If you don't have your Bibles, please follow along on the wall here behind me in front of you. Exodus 3, beginning with the first verse. And the Word of God says this. It's good because it's His Word, church. Amen. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that through the bush was on fire. It did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight why the bush does not burn up. Verse 4. And when the Lord God saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses says, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord God said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. And I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. Verse 8. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Verse 10. So now, go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Stop right there for a moment, please, church. That's a whole lot. And what I want you to concentrate right now for this moment, I believe that the Lord has asked me to preach to you about, is the 10th verse. Everybody look at Exodus chapter 3, verse 10, please. 
In the 10th verse, God tells Moses something incredible. He says, so now what? Go. So now go. Many of us, God may have laid into our spirit, into our heart, into our mind. Maybe you even heard a word where God said go and you didn't go. And I want to make it very, very, very clear that we're not lifting up or exalting Moses or his brother Aaron or what they did. We're just going to use him as an example. And we don't really have much time to get into this part of it, but, but Moses really didn't want to go. Matter of fact, in the, in the time frame between the burning bush, after what we just read, and in the time frame just before Moses goes and speaks to the people, it says in one of the verses there that God was getting ready to kill Moses. Anybody remember that part of it? God was getting ready to kill Moses. A couple things had gone on. God was sick and tired of Moses saying, I can't do it, 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 but what if, but what if, but what if, but what if. And then there was this little issue of Moses' son not being circumcised. And so it wasn't even Moses that saved himself. Does anybody know who circumcised his son? His wife. She saved him. Moses had it all screwed up. How many people have been there before? Right? And if you can't raise your hand to that, that's because you got it all screwed up. We, we, we've all had it all screwed up before, okay? So do it again. How many, ta- how many people have had it all screwed up? We've all had it all screwed up before. And so we're not, we're not, we're not lifting up Moses. Uh, we're lifting up the mighty name of God. Amen? But what we're going to do, what we're going to take a look at is see how incredible it is that God loves mankind, his creation, so much that God is willing to use people like us. God is willing to use people like Moses. Even when Moses fell short, fell short, fell short, fell short, fell short, and at the time was getting ready to be killed by a righteous God, God still used the man. Look at the 10th verse, please. God says to Moses, So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Notice what God is doing here, church. He's, he's using a man, not because God has to use a man, but because he wants to use the man. And it's not by the strength of Moses, but rather what God is willing to do through Moses. God is using a man to set the captives free. He did the same thing in the New Testament. God in flesh became man. And Jesus came down as a man, born as a child, raised as a man. And because God was willing to use a man, we all got set free. God in flesh. The good news for everybody here is this, men, women, children. If God could use someone like Moses... God can use someone like you. And it, it's dangerous within the church, especially the Catholic church, and I'm not knocking on anybody if you were raised in the Catholic church, but they idolize these types of people. And even in the, in the Christian, the Christian uh, denominations, they, 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 they can easily begin to idolize these people. It wasn't the people that made it special, it was God that made it special. And I've mentioned this a couple times before, and I've got to mention it again now. That there, there's going to be a time where, where the believers go up to heaven. Amen? And we're going to be walking in front of people like Elijah and people like uh, Josiah and uh, people like Elisha and, 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 and people like Moses and Abraham and Jacob, which is Israel. We're going, to be, we're going to be walking in front of these people. And we're going to be like, whoa! Moses! Man, tell me how it was when you walked through the water, man. But Moses is going to be like, no, 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 no. I lived on the backside of the cross, man. You, you lived on the front of it. And that means that you, church, have the opportunity to be filled with the Spirit of God. The power of God that the prophets long to have all the time. You get to have all the time. Did you know that? 
Did you know that? I mean, we're, we're, we're going up there thinking, whoa, I can't wait to see Noah. Whoa, I can't wait to see this one. I can't wait to see that one. But we forget how blessed we are as a child of God on this side of the cross that we get to have that power that they long to have. We get to have it today. That's incredible. And, and that's incredible. So, so the question is, what do we do with it? I think so many times we get caught up in the 8 to eight to 4, the 9 to 5, or whatever it is you're working. So many times we get caught up in the mundane routine of things that we forget when we leave the home that we've got the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. What will we do with it today? And so, yes, you may be going to the same job that you've been working at for 44 years, but what you need to think is, this is a new day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. How can I allow God to work through me today. See, most people in this room do not have the opportunity of working around people that are already all saved. That means you should be looking for opportunities, glory to God, church. You should be looking for opportunities when you go into your workplace. Who can I allow God to use me to touch today for his glory? How can I defeat the enemy at this workplace today? How can the Spirit of God work through me to affect the life of somebody else? And I guarantee you, when you look at your job like that, it'll be a lot different. Four o'clock will get there a lot quicker. Five o'clock will get there a lot quicker when you begin to work for God, not for self. He tells Moses in the 10th verse, look at it, please, church. He tells Moses in the 10th verse, he says, go. So now go. I'm sending you. Tell your neighbor, that's us. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now listen, church, before we move any further in Scripture, we've got to grasp this concept. Every one of us in this room know people in our very own personal lives who are slave and bondage to sin. Every one of us. Every one of us know folks that are not saved. Amen? Matter of fact, if, if, you, if everyone you know is saved, you've got the wrong circle. You're not getting out. You've got to understand what it is to go out. And just like God used Moses to set the Israelites free, God, church, God can use you to set free your spouse. God can use you to set free your children. God, church, can use you to set free your co-workers. God, church, can use you to set free your friends and use you to set free families. And he can even use you to set yourself free if you're willing to let him. I'm going to explain this in a minute, but with great confidence, look at your neighbor and say, I'm the one. I'm the one. I'm the one. Nobody, nobody joins a sports team and says, put me on the bench, coach. Put me on the bench, baby. I'm going to keep it clean for you, coach. I'm going to keep it warm for all the other kids when they come into bat. Please, please, coach, put me on the pine. Moses, in a sense, did that. He, oh, God, not me. Sure, not me, God. Oh, God, not me. But I can't even talk right, God. Oh, sure, God, not me. I, what will they say, God? Who should I say is sending me, God? Sure, God. Surely, God, not me. As Christians, I believe the church has lost the I'm the one mentality. See, I, I don't want to wait for someone else to minister to family members. I want to be the one. What if my family is busy that day? Or what if, what, if, what if they don't want to hear from this person, don't want to hear from that person? I got friends that won't minister to this one because they don't want to hear from that one. And those friends don't want to minister to that one because they don't want to hear from that one. Let me be the one. You know why we should have the I'm the one mentality, church? Because on the other side of the fence of that same person, Satan is saying, I'm the one. I'll get them. Hey, church. Satan says, hey, church. Y'all just keep being lazy and fighting. I'll do the work. I'll do the work. Jesus says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and what? Destroy. And as, as a church, we've forgotten that there is an enemy named Satan that wants everyone destroyed. He wants everyone killed. We have forgotten that. And so, and so while, we, while we can allow problems uh, and disagreement and hurt feelings to keep us from ministering, that stuff don't get to the devil. He just says, keep on, keep on. 
I'm the one. I'll mess with them. I'll have them. What we're going to learn through Scripture today is the I'm the one mentality. Not selfishly, not pridefully, but the I'm the one God. Here I am, use who? Me. So after all that being said, look at your neighbor and say, I'm the one. I'm the one. I mean, look, look, look. It, it, it comes down to I'm the one. I mean, when a, television, when a television show comes on, fellas, that you know you've been waiting all day to see, ain't nobody changing that channel, are they? Huh? We got, we got to have that same mentality when it comes to sharing our faith. I'm the one. I'll do it. If no one else is going to do it, I'll do it. And you know what? Even if somebody else wants to do it, God bless them, but I'm going with them. So it goes from I'm the one to we the one. But I'm not giving the devil a chance to mess that one up because I got to go too. I'm the one. I believe the numbers would be detrimental if we could see how many people that have already died and punishment is hell just because a Christian that was supposed to speak didn't speak to them. The church is too silent. In our neighborhoods, the church is too silent. In our schools, the church has become too silent. At our family reunions, the church has become too silent. In, in, in our state, the church has become too silent. In our nation, the church has become too silent. And for sure, for sure, for sure, on both sides of the aisle in the government, our church has become too silent. So it's time that the church rise up. The 10th verse, God says, see now, go. I'm sending you. Do you know, church, that when God sends someone, he sends them with a purpose? And it takes obedience to fulfill that. Look at, look at Exodus chapter 3, the 11th verse, please. The word of God says, but Moses said to God, who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. And God said, I will be with you. Hey, think about this, church. Do you need anything else than that? I mean, that's all you need. The fact that God is willing to say to his people, I will be with you. Listen, that promise does not just stand for Moses. Do you know today, sitting in this room, that that promise is for you too? Do you know that? Do you know that? Not, not only is it for you, I mean, I'm telling you, church, if you're not already, you have the ability to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit of God and all the gifts that come with it. I'm telling you, church, I'm telling you, that same God that spoke to Moses and said, I'll be with you, is the same God that speaks out to you and says, I'll be with you. The exact same God. So much so that he sent Jesus down to the earth to be with us. Verse 12, and God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And in the 14th verse, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Let me tell you something about what that statement means. I am that I am. Everybody ready? I'm glad those two over there are. When God said, I am that I am, he's saying, I don't change. I am that I am. Think about it, ladies, uh, Maybe some fellas, maybe you've gotten upset and you're in an argument and out of anger this flies off your lips. Well, I am who I am. Everybody ever been there? Don't point at nobody. It's too dangerous to do that. Well, I am who I am and you're not what? Oh, no, no, no. I am who I am and you're not going to change me. Don't tell me I'm like my mother. Don't tell me I'm like my father. I am who I am and you ain't changing that. God says, I am that I am. And it means this. If you need a healer, he's a healer. And nothing will ever change that. 
You need a redeemer? He already sent one named Jesus, and nothing's going to change that. You need rescuing? He's the best rescuer there ever is, and nothing's ever going to change that. You need knowledge? His word says that the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. He's the ultimate teacher, and nothing will ever change that. You need to be lifted up? His word says that I will set you high upon a rock, and nothing will ever, ever, ever change that. So he says, I am who I am. What I've told you about me is who I am. And there's nothing that is going to ever change that, Moses. Moses was nervous, and Moses says, who am I to set them free? And, and many of you, church, many of you may be feeling the exact same way due to your, due to your past life and, and the way your family and friends and coworkers know you how you used to live before accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. Many of you may feel, well, who am I to set these people free? Simply because the, uh, Satan has caused you to buy into a lie and make you feel inadequate. And so you say, God, but I've worked with her for 20 years. She knows how foolish I've been. I cannot invite her to church now. That's exactly what Moses was doing. Moses was going back into a land where he had killed someone. He was going back into a land where he was not living like the, the life that God wanted him to live. And, and, and Moses was allowing fear and doubt and feeling unequipped to, to shape and manipulate his decision. Everyone listen to this for a minute. Without the power of God... We're all unequipped. Everyone hear that? Without the power of God, we are all unequipped, including myself. Every one of us. We, 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 can, we, can have, we can have a band of brothers and a band of sisters. We can have a million troops. But without the power of God, without the blessing and the anointing and the favor of God, 10,000 can take over 10 million. It's done so many times in Scripture where the people of God defeat the enemies of God. Without God, church, every one of us is truly powerless. And Moses says, but I'm not good enough to go set them free. I'm not strong enough to go set them free. I'm not smart enough to go set them free. My speech is not eloquent enough, Father, to go set them free. Without God, no, it's not. And without God, it's the same way for every one of us in this room. No, it's not. But God says, when you get there, tell them that I am who I am has sent you. Moses goes along debating for a little while. For the sake of time, we can't go there. But I want you to understand this, church. Everyone listen to this clearly, please. If, if you're willing to lead the loss to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Hear this. If, if you're willing to lead those in captivity to the, to the knowledge of freedom in Jesus Christ, if you're willing to do that, which in turn will set them free, then God's promise to Moses also stands true for you in the 12th verse when God tells Moses, I will be with you. God says, I will be with you, church. But you've got to get to a point to where you're willing to be used. You've got to get to a point to where you're willing to be used, even the uncomfortable times and the unpopular times and the unrestful and even maybe uneventful times. Two things are going to happen that we're getting ready to look at in Scripture. Two things should absolutely happen if you're going to allow God to use you to set the captives towards freedom. And I'm going to show you this in just a minute. But if you're taking notes, write this down. Two things have to happen. Number one, everybody say number one. Number one is you have to be willing to speak to the captive. You have to be willing to speak to the captive. You have to be willing to share with the captive. We're going to see where Moses and Aaron did it. You have to be willing to go to the captive and say, look, you may not see this, but brother, but sister, you are drowning in bondage. And I'm telling you, I used to be in that exact same way. I used to be at the bottom of that exact same stinking smelly barrel. I know how it is because I've been there before. And I'm just telling you, God sent his son Jesus Christ down to this earth so that he could forgive me, so that he could wash me, cleanse me, make me new, redeem me, make me whole, set me free. Brother, sister, I'm telling you, he forgave me. And man, I'm not living a perfect life, 
but it's a whole lot better than what it was at the bottom of that barrel. That's number one. That's option one. You have to do that. You can't, you can't get around it. I say it's an option because you have a choice to do it or not, but I'm telling you, if you want to set the captive free, you've got to choose that option. You've got to choose it. This is why you can't be ashamed of your testimony, church. See, the, those in captivity, they got to know that you once were in captivity. Too many people in captivity outside the church look at people inside the church and think, well, they just think they're perfect. But if they knew everybody in the church, they'd realize we ain't. Amen? One of the best jobs Satan has ever done and the liberal media has ever done is make the unchurched think that the church are snobs. I'm telling you. I can't. Gretchen? Ain't no Gretchens in here, is it? All right. Gretchen, I can't believe he said that in church. Snob. One of the reasons the church body in America today is not where it is is because they don't have enough people telling what they need to hear. And I'm telling you, you walk around thinking that you're better than thou. It does nothing but crush your witness. It will hinder what the Spirit of God wants you to do. It will hinder what the Holy Spirit has for you to say. And so rather than do what you want to do, you've got to do what God wants you to do. So number one, you have to be willing to go to the captives. Now, it does not mean that you participate in what holds them captive. Everybody hear me? And listen, fellas, in other words, Friday night, you don't tell, you, you don't tell your wife, hey, baby, I'm going to go down to the bar. Pastor Lee said I had to go to the captives. I'm going to go on down and set them free. I'm going to set them free. And I'm going to go on down there. Because most of them, are going to be at a place of mind where they don't want to hear what you got to say anyway. Because that is the devil's playground. That's why you know what the bar is all about, because he was playing all over you for a long time. I mean, unless God distinctly tells you to go there, see him Monday at work. Amen? See him Monday at work. But you've got to be willing to see them somewhere. You've got to be willing to talk to them even when it's unpopular to talk to them. You've got to be willing to make a move that most of the churches won't make. The unpopular move. The uncomfortable move. So number one, you've got to be able to speak to the captive. Everybody say number two. Okay. This one some people may have never been taught before. And it may feel awkward and uncomfortable. But man... Ladies, I'm telling you, men and ladies, you got to grasp it anyway. Amen? Look at your neighbor and say, I ain't been taught everything. Yeah, okay. So now that we've acknowledged that, here it comes. You got to be willing to talk to Satan. Now let me finish that. My wife's probably down there sweating. What is he getting ready to do? Talk to Satan. I didn't say converse with him. I'm not saying listen to him. I'm saying command him. There's a difference. Jesus gives us the authority to command him. Many times in the New Testament. We have, we have authority. We have authority to command the enemy to leave in the name of Jesus. And the reason many Christians struggle, the reason many Christians suffer, is because when Jesus says, hey, heads up, this is layman terms, heads up, heads up, heads up, you've got a thief, and the thief is out there to steal, kill, and destroy. A lot of Christians, they, they suffer, and they don't understand, they don't remember what Jesus said, that there, there's an enemy, there's Satan that's trying to steal from them, kill them, and destroy them, and they don't understand why life is so hard. On this earth, we were never told that it was going to be easy. Even one of his own, Jesus had to look at and say, get ye behind me, who? In other words, you're out of my will right now. You're not, you're not, you're not fighting for this team right now. Get ye behind me. The church has got to remember. The church has got to be educated on the fact that you 
do have a God-given ability to look the enemy square in the face and say, in the name and in the blood of Jesus Christ, Satan, I rebuke you from being in this home. Satan, I rebuke you for messing with my kids. Satan, I rebuke you for getting up in my wife's mind or up in my husband's mind. Satan, I rebuke you from trying to steal my job. In the name and the blood of Jesus Christ, you're not welcome here. You're not wanted here. I'm standing on the belief and the principles of Scripture, and I'm trusting that God is greater than you are, and there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do that's going to come up against me and prosper because I'm walking in faith that I'm on the winning side. And just to remind you, Satan, God has won every fight he's ever been in, and today he ain't going to lose. So we're winning today too. In Jesus' name, amen. So you got to be willing to speak to the captive, and you got to be willing to remind Satan that he's lost already. You ever heard the term go down swinging? My oldest son, when he was younger, was at a, was at a karate event one time. He was just tearing this kid up. That just made his dad proud, you know what I'm saying? Just, it was legal fighting, all right? Everybody paid to be there. It was legal fighting. Pay every month. Your kid gets to take karate. I take him down there to karate. I, I didn't take him down there to learn how to make a sandwich teach him how to be tough, man, just in case he needs it. So he's down there, he's down there wailing on this kid, and uh, he goes down. Well, he just did what his old man taught him to do. If he goes down, that's when you make sure he don't get up. Because how many times have you seen a fighter get up and come back to what? Win! And so my son did what his dad had taught him to do. The kid goes down, still legal and fair play. No whistle is gone. So he goes over there to give him a little bit more. And the instructor, break, the instructor breaks in and says, whoa, whoa, what is this? That's not sportsmanship. And I said, well, everything I've been watching for 15 minutes is not sportsmanlike. This is not a sportsmanlike uh, fight, is it? I mean, this is karate. We hit each other. We kick each other. We punch each other. There's nothing sportsman about that, is it? He says, well, you should never hit a man while he's down. And I said, well, when else do you hit him? world. Do, do you go pick him up and say, hey, give me a good one right here. It's your turn. It's your turn. Give me a good one right here. I'm telling you that to say this. When you see that Satan's on the run, don't run away because scripture says when the Holy Spirit leaves a place, it goes up finding no rest in arid places. It comes back six times stronger than what it was when it left the place. I'm telling you, when you see it flee, you remind it why it's fleeing. Look, the reason that you no longer have presidents in my life is because I'm a child of God. I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. I done prayed your butt out of this home, and you're not welcome back in this home. I used to not read your word in here, but I do read it now, and I'm just letting you know that I may not know everything about the promises of God, but I'm standing on the little bit that I do know, and the little bit that I do know tells me that you've already been defeated. Don't waste your time in here. That's what it should be like. Man, if we had more praying mamas and daddies and grandmas and grandpas, there'd be a lot more well-behaved kids. They'd be in a lot less trouble. A lot less trouble. And when they went to school, rather than being taught something from the older people that don't know better, we'd be teaching them something. Our children have the opportunity to live a life of of Christ-like morals and values and principles in front of these unsaved teachers. I'm telling you, if you raise them up right, even at a young age, they can touch the older ones. Not because, of, not because of the power that they have, but because of the power of God living in that little saved soul. Being inside of that vessel. Moses is going back and forth in Scripture and he finally decides that, that he's going to make a move. God says he's going to bring his brother Aaron with him. We don't have time to get into that, but you need, to, you need to definitely go check that out in the next following verses. What I want you to do, since we've talked about topic one, speaking to the captives, and topic two, praying and letting Satan know that he's not welcome, we're, we're going to begin to get into the first topic right now. Go to Exodus chapter four. Look at the 29th verse, please. If you're going to set the captives free, sometimes it's not good enough just to sit in your prayer closet and pray. You've got to go do something. You've got to educate them. Exodus, 
Hey, let me just say this. One of the best uh, devices of the government is uneducating its people. Can you agree with me on that? And it's the same way with Satan. He doesn't want a church educated. He doesn't want a Christian educated because he knows that if, if a child of God gets educated and they understand the knowledge and the wisdom and the power of God that they're allowed to have and it educates that believer, I'm telling you, Satan knows what's about to happen and he don't like it. But you know what? As far as me and my household, he don't have a choice. Exodus. Chapter 4, we're going to begin with the 29th verse. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. And he also performed the signs before the people, and they what, church? They believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. Moses and Aaron, stop right there, church. Moses and Aaron confronted the captives and informed them that God had set them free. Well, what the Holy Spirit is even just showing me to this point, is to God be all the honor, glory, and praise for this. I, I had not thought about this before, but, but look at it. Uh, verse 30, and uh, we'll go back to 29. We're going to read it slowly. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. Now check this out. He also performed the signs before the people. Those were the signs that God had told them to do to prove that he was coming from God. All right, so he also performed the signs before the people, verse 31, and they what? Believed. Hey, look, there's nothing all, nothing all wrong with you standing before your sister if you're ministering to your sister or if you're ministering to your brother or you're ministering to your mom or your dad or you're ministering to coworkers, you're ministering to family, whoever, children, whoever, and say, look, let me tell you what I've seen God do for me. See, it says that Aaron and Moses, they went there and they performed the signs. Nothing wrong with you saying what God has performed in your life either. Now, notice what happens. Look at this. We've got to put it together. It says, it says he also performed the signs before the people. And because he performed the signs before the people, verse 31 says, and they what? Believed. 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 When I was younger, I had a good friend that that went to uh, a missionary event in Africa. And he said, man, I'm telling you, if, if you're not a Christian, it's hard to believe this when I say it. I said, well, man, you know I'm a Christian. Tell me, man. Tell me. Tell me. He says, man, I've seen people that couldn't see, see. I've seen people that couldn't walk, walk. He said it was incredible what people that lived in that poor of a nation that had nothing to go home to, they had nothing to trust in and believe in except this, this man named Jesus that we were teaching, that when they accept Jesus, listen, church, this is amazing, he said they actually believed that he could do what he said he could do. See, the church is hindered. Listen, the, the church in America is hindered because our nation is so spoiled. We believe sometimes some of the stuff that he says he could do, but the other things, so many churches tuck it in the Old Testament, or they tuck it in the day of saying, well, that was just when he was here on earth to advance his ministry. No, it wasn't. That's a lie from the pit of hell. That's just Satan trying to steal, kill, and destroy from the body of Christ. If Jesus did it then, Jesus is still able to do it now. Matter of fact, when he left his apostles, he said, you're going to be able to do greater things than these things that I've been doing. Not because they're better than Jesus, but just because Jesus knew that when he left and the Holy Spirit came upon all of them at Pentecost, he knew that the Spirit of God was going to work in them in such mighty ways that they were going to be able to do more miracles than what was shown that Jesus did in his little time here on earth. That's what it meant. I mean, that's incredible. And that's why I say when we stand before Moses in heaven, Moses is going to say, man, what did you do with all that power? Look at your neighbor and say, what are you doing? Yeah, don't be judgmental with that. Just be encouraging. Just be encouraging. Don't judge them. Just love them. Just love them with that. Don't judge them with that. Right? Because they were supposed to ask you what you've been doing. And you don't want to be judged either, right? Judge ye as you go be judged. You don't want to judge them. Power of the Holy Spirit, incredible, living in you. And it says, and they believe because of what they saw. Think about it. If more Christians, if, if listen to this, if every Christian in this room left here and went and told two people today, just two unsaved people about things that God has done, incredibly things, incredible things in their life that God has done, imagine the encouragement that it's about ready to shoot across this, com this community and the surrounding area. Imagine, imagine the move of the power of the Holy Spirit. If, if everyone in this room, everyone in this room left here today 
And each person told two people. Two people. What God has done in their life in the last two years. Oh, let me tell you. They got to be unsaved people. Listen, unsaved people, go, go to the captains. I'm not saying you can't work on the saved. I'm just saying right now, go to the captains this week. Go to the captains this week and let God work in the, in the captains. What's the count? Have you counted today how many people are here? No, in the room, right here. One, oh, I thought you said it was 60. All right. Roughly right at 170 people in this room. We're not counting the kids in children's church. Just 170 people right now. Times that by two. Somebody help me. 340. Two times zero is zero. Two times seven, 14. Carry you one. Two times one is two plus the one. That's 340. Hey, she said that's the hard way, but I grew up the hard way. <laughs> we didn't have no choice. That's how they taught it. <laughs> so if you, if you see it smoking up here sometimes and you see the gears turning, it's, it's not because I ain't smart. It's just because I've been taught the hard way. <laughs> no, race that, race that. I had no choice in the matter. That's just how. <laughs> Kids today think they got it bad, don't they? Well, we was taught the hard way. I don't want to do my homework. Man, I had the hard homework. You're going to do it. Because I had to do it. And I had to do the hard stuff. But look at it. It says in verse 30, And Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. And he also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. This, this, is, this is critical. This is vital right here, glory to God. Look, look at it. And it says, And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. All right, everybody look up here for a moment, because I feel the, the, the anointing and the strong presence of the Lord. It said that people believed just because someone said, God has done this. But then it says people bowed down and worshipped simply because it says, look at it, they found out that the Lord was concerned for them. So imagine if 340 people today, imagine if 340 people today get word that God is concerned for them. Man, I just feel the anointing all over it. You, you don't have a clue. I don't have a clue. We, we, we don't have a clue what the Holy Spirit would do with that one. If 340 people today got word that this God that they don't know is concerned for them. Concerned. You know what that means? That, that, that means that, wait a minute, wait a minute, are you, are you telling me, Pastor, are you telling me that, 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 that you as a Christian, you're really telling me that there's a God out there that's worried about me, he's concerned for the state of my soul. Yes, that's what I'm telling you, man. And he loves you. He loves you so much that he's willing to save you from all of it. 340 people today. Look at what happens in the, the fifth chapter, beginning with the fifth verse. We're going to read for a little bit, so I really need you to hang on and pay attention because you can't lose this. You cannot lose this, church. But God be all honor, glory, and praise. Exodus 5, beginning with the first verse. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the desert. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord God that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord God, and I will not let Israel go. In verse 3, then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you are stopping them from working. Stop right there at the fifth verse. I haven't planned on saying that, but I feel led by the Spirit to say, say it now. The same way Pharaoh 
tried to deceive and uneducate and trick the people by keeping them busy at work. It's the same way today. Satan tries to keep people away from church, work, busyness. You grind it out five days a week so hard that you can't get nothing done around the house. On Saturday, you feel like it's your day to just enjoy and go places, and rightfully so, that's your business. But on Sundays, how many of us have been tempted to get back to work around the house before? Appreciate the integrity of the honest ones. How many, how many of us have cut grass on a Sunday before instead of go to church? Done, done work before instead of going to church? He says, Pharaoh looks out and he says, the people, the people are too numerous. You're slowing them down. Aaron, Moses, get out of my face because you're stopping them from working. And if they stop working, they might get wind of what God's trying to do. If they pay attention to you, then they're going to pay attention to God. And if they pay attention to God, they'll realize that they're numerous enough to overthrow us. I don't want them educated. Pharaoh basically says, I just want them dumb. See, the enemy, just like Pharaoh, <laughs> praise God, listen, I'm telling you, you got to understand this. The enemy, just like Pharaoh, is okay with having millions and billions of people on their side just as long as they don't get educated. You see it sometimes in nations when nations are pleased and they're okay with Muslim leadership. And then all of a sudden, they understand what Muslim leadership does to a nation. And they get a group of people educated, wise enough and strong enough, smart enough to try to overthrow the ones in power. Satan knows that an educated individual is dangerous. The government knows that an educated individual is dangerous. False leadership knows that an educated individual is dangerous. And Pharaoh knew it. And Pharaoh says, he says to Moses and Aaron, do you see how numerous these people are out here? You're stopping them from working. And in verse 6 it says, that same day Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and foremen in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out. Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the men so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. Pharaoh did what many leaders are successful at doing. He called the truth a lie. Your government today calls the truth a lie. The leaders in this nation call truth lies. Christians are supposedly bigots and, and haters. Prejudice people just because they don't receive and accept anything that comes down the pipe. And so what Satan has done, he's done a wonderful job. Listen, he's done a wonderful job. The devil has done a wonderful job at making America think that the truth is a lie. He's been very successful at that. In verse 9, we, we, we find Pharaoh lying. He says, make the work harder. Make the work harder for the men so that they may keep working and pay no attention to the what, church? It was actually, it should. It was actually the truth. But Pharaoh doesn't even want the, the people in his lower leadership knowing that it's truth, so he dresses it up in a word called lies. Look at what happens next, church. Verse 10. Then the slave drivers and the foremen went out and said to the people, This is what Pharaoh says. I will not give you any more straw. Go and get your own straw wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced at all. See what's happening in this church. The, the, the Pharaoh and, and, and all of these leaders, what they're trying to do is take their minds off of the truth by making them work harder. They're trying to put the people into a stupor. So rather than them receive truth, Pharaoh says, 
make them work harder so they can't pay attention to it. Once you start to desire to know the truth, Satan will try to keep you so busy with all plethoras of opportunities just to keep you from hearing the truth. All of a sudden, oh, hey, listen, you ever, you ever try to get yourself right, you start getting right, and the people that didn't used to call you call you again? That's why. Verse 12, so the people scattered all over Egypt to gather stubble to use for straw, and the slave drivers kept pressing them, saying, complete the work required of you for each day, just as you had when you had straw. And the Israelite foremen appointed by Pharaoh's slave drivers were beaten and were asked, why didn't you meet your quota of bricks yesterday or today as before? And then the Israelite foremen went and appealed to Pharaoh, why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are given no straw, yet we are told make bricks. Your servants are, are being beaten but the fault is with your own people. And Pharaoh said, lazy. That's what you are, lazy. Satan tries to do the same thing, Christian. You try to rise up. That's what they just did. They tried to rise up and they said, it's not our fault. The Israelites said to Pharaoh, it's not our fault. It's your fault. And, Satan, and Pharaoh, just like Satan, he says, he name calls. He says, you're lazy. Satan does the same thing. Has he ever told you, you're not good enough? Ladies, you're not pretty enough. You know you, know you don't look how you wish you could look. You know, you know you don't have his heart. You'll never be good enough. You know you're going to be just like your daddy. You're going to, just like your mama said you would all them years, no good to nobody. You can't raise them kids good enough. See, as soon as the Israelites realized truth and the light bulb went off, ding, the enemy says, no, 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 no. I want you to believe in a lie. And because I want you to believe in a lie, I got to feed you new lies. You ever say, you ever hear the saying, one lie covers up another lie, covers up another lie, covers up another lie, covers up another lie, and there's no truth in that. Pharaoh gets nervous, shaking in his boots. <laughs> he knows it's our fault. You're lazy. No, it's your fault. It's your fault. It's your fault. You start standing on the word of God while you're praying, and all of a sudden, Satan, that once thought you were weak, says, oh, my gosh, he's equipped. Somebody told him, somebody told her the truth. Verse 17, Pharaoh said, lazy, that's what you are, lazy. That is why you keep saying, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now get to what, church? He says, now get to work. You will not be given any straw, yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. Verse 19, the Israelite foreman realized that they were in trouble when they were told you are not to reduce the number of bricks required of you for each day. Verse 20, and when they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, may the Lord look upon you and judge you. You have made us a stench to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Listen, church, when you try to lead captives to freedom, it's not always easy. Some of them are going to accept it quickly, and others are going to fight against it. And the reason they're going to fight against it is because there's going to be this newfound pressure that is now fighting and waging war for their soul that they've never known before because they've never been educated on the choice before. And now that they've been educated by you, that God is concerned for them, that God loves them. Now that you're out there to educate them, Satan's going to rise up and mess with them. He hasn't been messing with them yet because there's no reason to mess with the unsaved person that's uneducated. But as soon as the unsaved person begins to get educated, Satan comes in just like Pharaoh and says, he's lying. He's lying. Don't listen to him. He's lying. Don't believe what he's saying. God's not real. Don't listen to what he's saying about God. Jesus does not love you. Don't listen to him. Don't listen to him. He's a liar. You just get back to doing what you've been doing before you believe that nest of lies. That's what Satan does. 
all of a sudden when an uneducated individual gets educated that they have a choice. And now they've got the freedom of knowing the truth in that choice. Satan trembles. The word says he comes as a roaring what? Lion. They say that the only lion that actually roars is one who's lost his teeth. And the reason he has to roar so loud is because he ain't got no bite. And so he's already been dethroned from his pride or his pack. And now he has to make himself look fierce. And since he no longer has any weapons in his teeth, he's got to sound ferocious. But he's already lost his bite. When Jesus died on the cross and he rose three days later, Satan lost the bite. Lost the bite. He's got no victory in your life. He's got no power in your life. He's got no authority in your life if you're a believer. If you're a believer. And if you're here today and you've not asked Jesus Christ to save your soul, the struggle you're feeling is the simple fact that Satan is out there trying to steal you, kill you, and destroy you. And just because no one's ever told you that before doesn't mean that it's not true. Praise God, you've finally just been educated on the truth, not the lie. Satan has no bite. And when truth is given, he trembles. He trembles. I'm going to run through some scriptures really quickly, so I need you to have your fingers ready. Exodus chapter 7, verse 14. We're going to start there for a minute. You remember there's two things you got to do. We're getting ready to wrap it up with a second thing. The first thing we talked about, church, was you have to be able to talk to the captives. Amen? Amen. All right, we're going to run through really quickly through the second thing. Exodus chapter 7, the 14th verse says this, church. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is unyielding. He refuses to let the people go. Get Pharaoh in the morning as he goes out to the water. Wait on the bank of the Nile to meet him and take in your hand the staff that was changed into a snake. Verse 16. Then say to him, that is Pharaoh, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, let my people go so that they may worship me in the desert. You remember earlier, hallelujah, praise God. I love it when the Holy Spirit puts it together, church. You remember earlier where it says, you will tell them the deeds that God has done, or or rather they saw what Aaron and, and Moses had done, that God had done through them, and it says they believed. And then it says, and then it says, when they found out that God was concerned for them, they bowed down and worshiped. All right, so number one was telling them. Here's number two. Uh, Number two point that you have to do, church, you have to speak boldly to the enemy. You've got to speak boldly to the enemy. Everybody hear that? You've got to speak boldly to the enemy. And God said to Moses right there in this chapter, he says, you go down by where he's at, at the water, and you say to him, let my people go that they need to come out here and worship me. Now I want to take you with that in mind, really quickly, really quickly, somewhere else in Scripture, go to Exodus chapter 8. Go right down. Let's look at the first verse. Exodus 8, 1. Then the Lord God said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord God says, let my people go so that they may, what, church? Worship me. Go to Exodus chapter 8, verse 20. Same chapter, the 20th verse. Then the Lord God said to Moses, get up early in the morning and confront Pharaoh as he goes to the water and say to him, this is what the Lord God says, let my people go so that they may, what, church? Worship me. Go over to the ninth chapter, the first verse. Uh, Exodus chapter 9, glory to God, verse 1, praise the Lord, says, Then the Lord God said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says, Let my people go so that they may what, church? Worship me. Look at the 13th verse in chapter 9. Exodus chapter 9, verse 13. Then the Lord God said to Moses, Get up early in the morning. Confront Pharaoh. Everybody say confront. Confront Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says. Let my people go so that they may, what church? Worship me. Listen, church, listen. You never want to be at a place where you have conversations, debating and combating conversations with Satan. 
But what you do want to have is to know that you've got the authority in the name of Almighty God that you can call him out and say in the name and the blood of Jesus Christ. And the reason you have to say it in Jesus' name is because that's the name that every knee's got to bow to, every tongue's got to confess to. You can't go out there just swinging on your own. Everybody understand that? You cannot do that. You cannot do it to yourself. But there's power and authority in the name of Jesus. And when you stand behind the name of Jesus, you stand in the name of Jesus, you now have the authority, all of the authority that's inside that great name. You understand that? And so what we say is, in the name and the blood of Jesus Christ, Satan, I rebuke you. You've got no room here. And you can go to the enemy and say, get off my land but it's up to you to want to do it. Moses argued for a long time, didn't want to do it. Thank God he came to his senses. And even at his brother Aaron, Jesus, when he sent him out, what did he send him out in? Twos. It doesn't mean that you can't work by yourself, but it sure is nice having strength in a brother or sister. And there's also accountability there. When you leave here today, there is a potential that 340 people can hear that God loves them. And if you're saved, I'm telling you, you should have the power of that spirit inside of you working. And we cannot even begin to imagine what God would do for 340 people's lives. That could drastically be changed. But you've got to confront them. And then you've got to go confront the enemy that's fighting to destroy their soul. Stand up here for a minute, Pop. If you don't mind, please. Brother Marshall, will you come up here for a minute? Dad, just right here. Right there, Brother Marshall. Let's just say that, uh, Joe, come up here, stand right here for a minute. Let's just say that Joe calls Dad. Joe's saved, Dad's not saved. Joe ministers to Dad. Brother Marshall is the Lord, and he's going to reach out. He's going to reach out at this invite of sharing knowledge and truth that God loves them, the Holy Spirit, and go ahead and just, just wrap your arms behind my dad for a minute. The Holy Spirit comes in on this invitation, and he's like, yes, man, please, listen, listen to what he's saying. I'm going to open your mind up. You're going to receive this. Your heart's going to be ready. And what's going to happen is Pharaoh, Satan, sees that. And he says, what did he do? What? No. 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 And he tries to get close, but he can't get but so close. Righteousness and darkness have how much in common? He he, he wants to get in there, but as long as the Holy Spirit's working, he can't touch. He can just whisper, he's lying, man. He's lying. Don't listen to him. Don't listen to him. Please, please, you can't listen. You can't listen. You can't listen. And what happens is, is that there's about to be a decision made in this life. If he chooses Christ because of the invitation that was set forth from this brother right here, then all of a sudden, wrap them up, wrap them up, wrap There's a protection. Everybody say shield. Shield of faith comes in. He don't even know he's got a shield of faith yet, just got saved. But it don't mean that it ain't there. He had faith enough to get saved, he's got a shield of faith. The enemy waits, go ahead and sit down, for Joe to leave. And he comes up and he's trying to, ah, man, how do I get him? I know you. I haven't messed with you in a long time because you've been staying away from them crazy church people. But I know what you like. I know what you really like. Now, that's my dad. All y'all know that. And I'm getting ready to say some stuff about him that's not true. I'm going to use him for an example. (laughs) I know, I know what you like. I know what you like. You struggled with, with pornography for all your life. And what, I, what I'm going to do is tomorrow when you show up to work, there's going to be a beautiful woman that comes in. And she's she's going to catch your eyes. 
And I want you to, I want you to think about what th- you used to think about before you became a Jesus lover. Oh, I know, I know, I know the guys that you used to hang with. Matter of fact, I'm going to tell one of them to call you right now. I need you to call that man. I'm going to put him in your seat. You got to call that man right now. I feel like calling Kenny Day right now. For some reason, it just popped up. Hey, Kenny, man, this is going to be a blowout at the house this Friday. You remember those days? The blowout. Whose choice is it to go to the blowout? All right, go ahead and have a seat for a moment. Go ahead. We're going to close right here. But I want to take you to one more place in Scripture. Please just give me another 30 minutes, okay? Here, go here. Yeah, go ahead. No, don't get scared. Don't get scared. Really, it's not 30 minutes. Just really, really, really calm down. Somebody probably just looked at his wife and said, man, you didn't say it was going to be like this. I'm leaving. All right, but don't worry about it. Don't worry. Look, let God work. Look, last place, go to Exodus chapter 10 for a moment. Exodus chapter 10. And, and, and you've got to see this in Scripture. We're going to look at the 21st verse. Exodus, Exodus 10, 21. And this is what it says. Then the Lord God said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky so the darkness will spread over Egypt. Darkness that can be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky and total darkness covered all Egypt for three days. And no one, no one could see anyone else or leave his place for three days. And yet all the Israelites had light in the places where they lived. Christians, you got light in you, Amen. Verse 24, then Pharaoh summoned Moses and said, go, worship the Lord. Even your women and children may go with you. Only leave your flocks and herds behind. Verse 25, but Moses said, you must allow us to have sacrifices and burnt offerings to present to the Lord our God. Our livestock too must go with us. Not a hoof is to be left behind. We will have to use some of them in worshiping the Lord our God. And until we get there, we will not know what we are to use to worship the Lord. Moses told Pharaoh, he says, we're going to leave this place. And we're taking everybody with us. And we're going to bow down. And we're going to worship God. We're going to bow down and we're going to worship God. And everybody we got, every man's coming, every woman's coming, every child's coming, everything that we got. Is coming. And, and, and Pharaoh looks at Moses. Pharaoh looks at Moses and, and Pharaoh says, Absolutely not. I got to hold on to something you still have because if I give you everything, you may not come back to me, says Pharaoh. Satan does the same thing. He's a Pharaoh. He does the same thing. Satan says, Okay, go to church today. Act like the church people if that's how you want to act. But, but you can still smoke a little weed. You can still get drunk on Fridays. You can still look at those dirty magazines. You can can still watch those movies. You can still hang out with those fellas. You can still hang around with those ladies. You can still go to the bars. Look, look, if if you want to play church, Christian, if you want to play church, I'll let you play church. You see, the church is too good at playing church. It says if you want to play church, I'll let you play church. Please, I'd rather you play church and deceive yourself than get right and truly be the church. Please play church. Do you realize that? Once you're saved, once you're saved, Satan trembles so violently because you've got the truth that he would rather you pretend church than actually be church. He's okay with you being here today as long as you're not obedient to what you've heard from the Word. He's okay with you being here today. He, he's okay with you singing as long as you really don't mean it. You could sing to the rooftops, but if it not be from your heart, Satan's okay with it. You could, you could memorize every word there is that God and his prophets ever spoke, but unless you live it, Satan's okay with it. He's all right with it. So when you leave here today, our question is, what do we do? What do we do? If we just reach out to two people over the next 15 hours or whatever, 340 people can hear today that God is in love with them. What do we do? 
That's what we do. We reach out to the captive. We speak authority over the enemy. And when the enemy tries to reveal it as lies, we proclaim it as gospel, the truth. Stand with me, please. Father, we lift up your holy name. God, it's you. It's you. You alone are worthy, Father. You alone are worthy. Father, we lift up the 340 people right now. God Almighty, that will hear today that you love them, that you're concerned for them, that you care for them. God, we lift those people up right now. In the precious name and the blood of Jesus Christ, we lift them up, Father. God, I pray that every ear will be ready to receive and hear, that every heart will be set free to be changed today. God, I pray that where the enemy is prevalent in their life, that in the name of the blood of Jesus Christ, he has to flee right now. That over the next course of this day, into the night, Father, that they will be waiting, and we proclaim this, that they're waiting, that they're waiting, they're expecting something different to come into their life today. God, I pray that they feel a void and that today they know that it's time to stop running and allow your Holy Spirit to fill that void. May today be the day. Right now, we speak to the enemy in the name and the blood of Jesus Christ, Yeshua. Satan, you are not welcome here. You are not welcome in the conversations that will take place today. You are not welcome to lord over or hang over or whisper the lies into the people that are going to be ministered to today. Regardless of how long these people have been coming to church, may we reach out and let people know that God loves them. That God loves them. For every person here in this room, if you're willing to take that challenge, if you're willing to take a challenge and you're willing to reach out to two people, two people, then what I'm going to ask you to do is, I'm going to ask you to come forward to the altar just for a moment. If you're willing to reach out to just two people today, just two people, what I want to do is I want to pray a blessing over you. If you're willing to just minister to two people, it can be two of your family members. It can be two of your children that are not saved. It can be, it can be your mom and your dad. It can be aunts or uncles or grandparents. It could be old people. It could be young people. It could be your bosses, your supervisors. It could be co-workers. It could be your spouse. It could be brothers or sisters. It could be whoever that is not saved. Father, we pray right now in the name and the blood of Jesus Christ. We lift up. We lift up these disciples. We lift up these servants of you, Father. God, that you would place two people on our hearts, two people that we would not be able to shake off, we would not be able to shake loose. Give us two people, God. Give us two people to reach out to, Father, to proclaim your goodness, to proclaim your gospel, to proclaim your salvation. Father, anoint us. Anoint our words. May the conversation go so smoothly. May there be, may there be no nervousness. God, give us two people and then give us the words, Father. Give us the words to say. God, may, may the people that we talk to today and tonight, may they be ready to listen. May there be no coarse joking. May there be no silly jokes. May the conversation be anointed and be serious. God, this is a soul matter. This is a soul salvation issue, Father. God, this could be the conversation that saves their soul. Choose us, Lord. Use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, give us the words to say. Even, Father, if we don't have the words until they pick the phone up and say hello, may we have the faith, even without words, to know that you're going to speak. God, I pray that your anointing travels through our voices and that our voices are a welcoming sound to their ears, to their hearts. God, I pray that today, right now, you even work in the lives of those 340 and you speak to their hearts right now. May we call at the right time. May we text at the right moment. May we email at the right time. May we go see the neighbor at the right time. Your time. 
Father, we're believing for many salvations in the precious name and the blood of Jesus Christ. All God's people said, amen. Let's give God a clap of praise and a shout. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.